All right, it's my great pleasure. First, I'd like to thank the organizers for the opportunity to speak. And what I'd like to tell you about this morning is how does one take an idea from the laboratory and actually turn it into a real world product? So I brought a small membrane, and I'm going to talk about conducting polymers. And I'll start telling you about a basic research project. But eventually, I will show you that we now have a membrane that can separate oil from water. And it can clean up the mess left by oil fracking. When one does oil fracking, for every barrel of oil, you get about 7 to 10 barrels of oily water. And so this membrane is just a small version. This version could fit under your sink at home and clean up house water. But I'll show you giant ones, yay big and yay long. You put hundreds or thousands of them in your oil installation. And you can actually clean up the mess left from oil fracking. And the way it works is we've developed a membrane that is hydrophilic. And all membranes out there, because they're organic polymers, are hydrophobic. And so they like oil, they hate water. This one likes water, hates oil. So you take dirty water, oily water, and you put it through. It just has to spiral through. It just has to go through one layer, and clean water will come out the other side. All right, so with that, how do we start from a basic research problem and eventually come up with an application? And so here's polyamylene. It's one of the simplest of the conjugated polymers. It's also one of the most widely used commodity chemicals, aniline, but it's very cheap. And I can, don't have time to tell you about all these things, but I will focus on, on a few. I'll tell you how we make nanofibers, how we can make sensors, memory devices, catalysis, welding, and then we'll get to these membranes. Okay, to start with, um, I had, this was, I had the opportunity to work with Alan McDermott and Alan Heger in graduate school on the first conducting polymer, and that is polyacetylene. And here's the last article I wrote with Alan McDermott, and actually the first one I wrote at UCLA. And what you'll see is this is a conjugated polymer, like we heard with graphene and a lot of these 2D conducting materials, has a conjugated network. So in this case, we have alternating double and single bonds. And that supplies the pathway. You still need to, to dope this either p-type or n-type. And one of the best dopants is iodine in the form of I3 minus. So it removes an electron from the chain, allowing this to become a very highly conducting material. And I'll put up Alan McDermott's picture. Um, of course, he passed away a few years ago, but he and, and Alan Heger and Hideki Shurikawa shared the Nobel Prize about 20 years after I and a hundred other people worked on, worked on this polymer. And we had a joke when I was in graduate school that I don't think you had ever heard, but I told it on, um, there's a Nobel Prize Symposium at the University of Pennsylvania. And the joke is, what is the only true application for this polymer? And the answer to that is to produce PhDs. And the reason is, this is a very air sensitive polymer. The n-type material will actually burn up in air, the p-type will oxidize within minutes and within um, a few weeks, it will actually lose its, its conjugation. And so I said on this occasion, we now know it's a dual use material. So besides uh, PhDs, we now know it can work for Nobel Prizes. But almost no one works on this because of its air sensitivity. In fact, here's what it looks like. You can see why people were interested in it. Here's the cis form, the trans form, and just a piece of aluminum foil. And it looks like a metal, even though it's a, it's a semiconductor, just a small band gap semiconductor. And then when you dope it, it becomes conductive. But OK, so now we don't work on this anymore. But what do we work on? Well, we work on air-stable polymers. And polyaniline, here it is. Here's the aniline group. We just polymerize it in head-to-tail fashion. And this is quite a good conductor. In fact, if you dope it with HCl, you get over 10 orders of magnitude change in conductivity, and you can reverse this in base. And what happens is all the any nitrogens, the double bonded nitrogens, become pronated, and you get charge along the chain, p-type doping. So a number of years ago, I was listening to a lecture at UCLA by a guy from Aerospace Corporation named Bruce Wilde. And he put up this picture. And he said, Aerospace Corporation, they're a US government Air Force contractor. And he said, as people live closer to launch sites, we need to know what happens to these plumes on rocket launches. And so he was developing sensors. And he said that one of the cheapest sensors is a resistive type sensor, just measure the change in, in resistance. And so one of the byproducts of um, ammonium perchlorate that, that's being used as an oxidizer and the aluminum as a fuel is HCl. 
And so he said he's developing these HCL sensors. So when he was done, I said to him, you know, I've got a conjugated polymer that if you expose it to HCL, has over 10 orders of magnitude change in conductivity. He said, that sounds great, send me some. So I did, and three weeks later he called me up, he said, I've got good news and bad news. I said, we'll start with the good news. He said, well, it works as a sensor. I said, what's the bad news? He said, well, it's slow. So I met with my group, and we decided if we could make a nanoform of this polymer, we could uh, speed up the sensor properties. But before we did this, we checked in the literature, and people had looked at making nanopolyaniline. Um, Tom Vine's group did it in a zeolite. Um, Chuck Martin's group did it in a nanopore membrane. Although then you've got it in something, and you've got to figure out how to take it out. Uh, Professor Wan's group looked at using self-assembly with functional molecules. And uh, even Alan McDermott, working with Frank Coe, did electrospin. But none of these methods are particularly scalable or easy to get the pure nanofibers. So we developed another method. And it's interfacial polymerization. And you probably know that nylon can be made by putting one component, a diamine, and taking it with a diacid, and putting one in water and one in an organic. Well, we just took aniline, and we put it in some organic, doesn't really matter which. We took aniline, and we need an oxidizing agent. So ammonium peroxide sulfate is a very cheap oxidizing agent. People use it in swimming pools and things. And so we just layered that on top. And you'll see within 30 seconds at the interface, we start forming this conjugated polymer. How do you know? Well, the pi to pi star transitions into visible, so you can see the nice color. And this is 30 seconds, this is a minute, two minutes, and three minutes. And what happens is we particularly chose the aqueous, the organic phase to be more dense than the aqueous phase. So that what happens is the aniline down here, as it forms polyaniline, the polyaniline is dope, it's a salt, so it goes into the water. And so the growing polymer stays away from the monomer. And because of this, instead of getting an agglomerated form of polyaniline, we end up with nanofibers. And here are the nanofibers. They're about 30 nanometers in diameter. They're micron in length. And we published this um, a number of years ago. This has become probably the most highly cited paper on polyaniline since then because it's very easy to do. You can make all the nanofibers you like. And here's HCL. So I said about 30 nanometer diameter, micron in length. If you switch to camphor sulfonic acid, the diameter goes up to about 50 nanometers. And if you go to perchloric acid, it goes up to about 120 nanometers. I know these look thinner, but I changed the scale bar by a factor of 10. So we have some control over these nanofibers. Now, at the time, we were interested, and everybody was looking at polyaniline was making these agglomerated forms, which are very hard to process. It's one of the big problems with conducting polymers, is how do you actually do anything with them, especially if you have agglomerates? So we went back, and using a syringe pump, we put one drop of aniline into acid and oxidant, and we stopped the reaction and imaged it. And lo and behold, you get nanofibers. So what was everybody doing? Well, what happens is, as soon as you add the next drop, you renew the fibers on top of fibers, and very quickly you get agglomerates, and then this is hard to deal with. And so it became obvious that there must be a better way to do this. And so we came up with a very simple method. And the idea is, if you take oxidant and aniline, you put them together at room temperature in a stoichiometric or not. You can simply throw them together. You will use up all the aniline. You can't have secondary nucleation and growth, and you end up with nanofibers. And I was sure this is a key thing. It's very simple, but it enabled us to scale this massively. And I will show that later on. And of course, if you're going to do an application, that is the key. All right. You can take the dope form or the DDO form, and you can put it on any surface you like. This is on glass. And if you look under a microscope, it's very flat. And if you look under high resolution, you'll see the nanofibers. So here's the nanofibers. And they're quite transmitting if they're thin. This is greater than 90 percent transmitting through the visible region. And then we learned another processing technique that I want to bring up because a lot of people may find this useful for their own work. So it turns out if you take oil and water, and you've all done this with salad dressing, right? They form two phases. And if you shake them together, you can mix them, but they will break up and they'll form a catenoid. Here's this catenoid shape. And it turns out that if you have nanofibers in that catenoid, they'll extrude up the side of the walls. And I want to show you this, and I don't think I'm going to have to, for some reason, this kicked out in the movies before, but I will simply uh, try to 
find the movie on my desktop. I don't think I'll see if it will play. No, it's not playing. Okay, sorry about that. What, what's going to happen is if we shake this up, it will redissolve or redisperse the polyamine the material. And then as the catenoid breaks up, it will send it up the wall. And you can literally grow a monolayer of this. And you can do it again and grow another monolayer. And you can dry it out. So what, the reason I wanted to show you this is because this is a process. You can use this for polyamine in the dope form. You can use it in the de-dope form. You can even use it for polyphyacin. We just chose it because of the nice colors. Here's what it looks like. So this is the dedo form, so we shake it up, and you'll see it starts growing up the side of the wall. Why? Because the nanofibers want to get away from the interface. And there's a layer, a monolayer of water, or a layer of water on the glass, and so they follow it up. And so you can grow these nice layers. And if you happen to put a slide in, you'll grow these layers. And you can grow, you can do this once, you can dry it out, you can put it back in, grow again, you can make any thickness you want. And this works for polyamide, but you can do this with anything you want. You can take any nanoparticles. We've done it with silica. We've done it with graphene, all sorts of things. So it, it, we think it's a useful process. All right, getting back to sensors. So a resistor sensor is nothing more than a slit between two pieces of metal. And you can put a drop of polyamide on here, and then you can bring up a vapor, and you can measure the change in resistance. And if you're going to do this for a experiment, and I'll show you, you can actually do this for a classroom experiment. You take a piece of copper foil and cut it with the scissors. But of course, if you're going to publish in, in sensor journals, you're going to have to use interdigitated electrodes. And here's an array of interdigitated electrodes. You can use many. And what you look at is a change in resistance versus time, and you'll see some sort of uh, response. One technical slide. So it turns out that the surface area of a normal material is inversely related to thickness. So if you do a sensor and it's slow, what you need to do is make it thinner. But it turns out if your sensor material is composed of nanofibers, and here's the diameter of these nanofibers, and when we model this, the surface area is no longer dependent on the thickness. It's proportional, it's inversely proportional to the diameter. So if you can have thinner nanofibers, you will get a faster response. And that's exactly what we found. So what we're doing here is we're bringing up our material to HCl vapor, 100 parts per million. We're doing a change in resistance on a log scale versus time. Here's conventional polyamine. So it sees the HCl, it dopes it, the resistance starts to drop. The nanofibers drop six orders of magnitude faster. And so we got very excited about this. And we did what all academics do, right? We sat down and wrote a proposal. And reviewers do what they do, and they looked at it, and a couple of reviewers said, oh, this is really nice, give money, and a couple of reviewers said, there's a problem. And the problem was that it's slow. And then I said to Bruce, I said, I don't understand it. The whole idea behind making these nanowires is to make it fast. How do, why are they telling us it's slow? And then he said, oh, there's a thing in the uh, sensor community where they look at the 90% response rate where the curve turns. And if you look at where a curve turns, a lot of time has passed. Except that's because sensor people use linear scales, not log scales. So here's the same data plotted on a linear scale. So normalized resistance 0 to 1 versus time. And you'll see that our nanofibers respond in less than two seconds. And I'll go back just because it's probably oops, worth, worth looking at. So of course, the 90% the response rate is somewhere in there that you can't, can't see. And so the next year, of course, we reset it with, with this slide. And nobody complained that these were, were, were not fast. All right, going back to the log scale, this is the thickness dependence. You can see that um, this is normal polyamylene that as you make it thinner, it responds. But the nanofibers have no thickness dependence. And so here's the, again, back to the log scale versus time. This is a 0.2 micron thick film. Here's a 2 micron thick film. So we change it by an order of magnitude. There's no difference in, in the reaction. And I think you can see this if we look at the electrode surface. So this is a conventional piece of polyaniline. And of course, you hit the gas comes in, hits here. You've got to wait till you get some diffusion and you get some electrical signal. But if you look at our nanofiber film, there is no surface. It's just a mat. And as long as the gas comes in and, and as long as the electrical signal can go to the surface, 
you will get a very quick response. And so I think visually you can see why nanofibers are, are very useful. Of course, besides acids, you can do bases. You can take the HCl dough form and we can bring up ammonia. And this is at, at less than one part per million, so you can't smell this. Your nose is very sensitive to ammonia, but the best nose cuts out at about 25 parts per million in there. But this sensor has no problem. You turn it on, it senses ammonia. This one's reversible. You turn it off, you can go back and forth as many times as you want. So one of my students said, oh, we can build a simple sensor so people can see it. So we went over to Radio Shack and he got an AD for a few cents, put in a comparator circuit, and then we got this fancy independent electrode from Aerospace Corporation. But all we did was put a drop of um, polyamine, you can see the green film. And again, I think this movie's not going to play. But uh, this is Zhe Jing Wang, who's a professor at Northwestern. But when he was with me, he did this. I'll just click on it. No, it's not doing anything. Um, what should happen is we should, he should dip this in here. There's one part per million of ammonia. And it takes about a little less than two seconds. The sensor turns on and will pull it off. It will, it will turn back on. And if you turn back off, and you can do it again. But if you smelled this, you would not smell any ammonia. And we turned this into a classroom demonstration, actually, for, for one of our labs. Um, first is a grad student, M285. And here's one of our grad students looking at an oscilloscope and seeing the, the dope material. So this is in, in JCAM Ed, if anybody wants to use this in their classroom. We've even taught this now to undergraduates. To, we've taught it to, to thousands of students. And we use this for high school outreach projects, because you can make this sensitive to almost anything that you like, any acid or any base. And now you may wonder, can you do anything else? Well, I'll pick on um, hydrogen sulfide. Deadly gas, right? But it's a very weak acid. And so this is resistance versus time. If you bring up doped or, or de-doped nanofibers, there's really hardly any response to hydrogen sulfide. But we found if we add copper chloride, and the idea is that copper chloride will react with hydrogen sulfide to produce copper sulfide and HCl. And so you can see with the nanofiber, you can get a very fast response to this. Now, of course, what we're doing is we're taking a weak acid and turning it into a strong acid. And then you can say, well, how can you tell the difference between HCl directly and HCl produced from this reaction? And the answer is you can't with one sensor head. But if you put two sensor heads, of course, you could tell the difference. And we've shown you can measure all sorts of things using this thing. We can do phosgene. We can do RC. And we teamed up with a small startup company called Next Dimension. And they have a handheld device. It looks like a multimeter, but what it is is an electronic nose. And this is a snout. And if you look inside it, what there is is there's 32 interdentated electrodes. And so they, it turns out that polymers are very good at swelling when they see organics. And so they can put traditional polymers, and they can measure all different kinds of organics. But what's very difficult to measure are things like acids and bases. So they put a few of our materials on here, dope differently. And using neural network programming, you can tell almost anything from anything else. And so we actually did this, and, and we were able to send it to a military test range with Homeland Security and show that they, that they could sense almost any kind of, of deadly materials. And just for fun, you may wonder how sensitive are these. Well, here's, we're doing n-butylamine at 24 parts per billion. Now, you may say, why would I care about that? But most of you probably like to eat sushi, right? And when you go to the sushi restaurant, how do you know if that sushi's from today or a few days ago? Well, if, it, if, it lasts, if it's there for a while, you, you can smell the, the fish going bad. But you could actually have a little sensor, and you could figure out whether that sushi was from today or, or a few days ago. And eventually, we'll have a, a biosensors where you go to your physician, you breathe on some card, and it will tell the physician that maybe you should check for this or check for that. So it's an interesting kind of idea for simple sensors. All right, other things we can do with this polyanalyte is we can grow gold nanoparticles. Now, these aren't pretty gold nanoparticles, but they're well dispersed. How do we do that? We just take chlorooric acid, HAUCl4, gold in the plus three state, and as soon as it hits this redox active polymer, it will be reduced to gold zero. And we can control the size of these little dots because by the time, temperature, and concentration. And so you can see these, if we blow them up, you'll see here's a 10 nanometer bar. So this is about a 30 nanometer diameter fiber, less than 
little gold nanoparticles. Now, why do we want to do that? Well, there's a lot of devices we can build with this. And so one is crossbar memory. So my colleague, Yan Yang in material science, puts down these crossbars. And he was interested in the goal, but he said, you've got to turn off the conductivity. So we simply hit this with base. So we use the pollen to grow the nanofibers. We hit it with base. Now they're disconnected. And at each crossbar point, we can store one bit of information. So this is a current voltage curve. You can see it turns on at about 3 volts. It goes to a high conductivity. At minus 5 volts, it turns off. And all it is is a charge transfer reaction between the polyaniline and the gold. And you can see it here. Here's the crossbar memory. This was an article devoted to memory. And my former colleague, um, Frazier Stoddard, here's one of his devices that he went on to, to win the Nobel Prize for. I have another colleague, Paula Dianconescu, who's an expert in catalysis. And when she heard about our gold nanoparticles, she asked if we could do palladium nanoparticles. So here they are. And she used this to do Suzuki coupling reactions. So here's an aryl chloride and boronic acid. And at low temperature, relatively low temperature in water, you've got a very high yield of these coupling reactions. And so you can use this as a scaffold for doing other kinds of things. Now, one more thing I wanted to show you is this is a scanning electron micrograph of these nanofibers. And if we bring up a flash of light or a laser, we can actually get these to melt. Now, most materials will absorb light, in this case, because it's, it's uh, conjugated polymer and visible. But what it does is it takes that light, and it actually causes a melting reaction. Now, you may say, well, why can't you just heat it up? Turns out, if you try to heat one of these conjugated polymers, they simply cross them, and you get a mess. But with this light, it heats up so fast, it melts very nicely. And you can do all sorts of patterning with this. And so here's a copper TM grid. This is the dope form. It's green. And we're going to use the grid to protect it. We're going to hit it with a flash of light, and then we're going to move the grid. And if you look at this, so this is before, this is after, move the grid. Where the grid protected, it's still green and nano. Where the grid did not, it actually melts and it becomes reflective. And so you get this nice color contrast. And you can use this to make all sorts of devices. So here's one where we're taking a 780 nanometer laser, just a cheap laser, and we're making interdetailed electrode patterns. And you can see this, we can make this on an ordinary CD disc. And then we can use this to make sensors. Another thing we can do is we can control the penetration depth of the light. And so here's a cross section. What we've done is we've used the laser to melt just the top surface. The bottom surface is still nano. And so what will happen is if we bring up acid, and acid will dope this part, and as the acid goes in, this part will expand, but the melted part cannot. And so we've created an actuator. So if you look at this, this is a piece of, uh, about the length of your finger. And as it's exposed to acid, this part will have to expand, and it will force this to curl. And it will curl two full rotations in about 20 seconds. And then if you put it in base, it will uncurl. So we developed a mechanical actuator. And this work was done originally with um, my colleague Gordon Wallace and Jeff Sphinx in Australia when I was on sabbatical for the Fulbright Fellowship. And I just wanted to prove to you that I really did spend time in Australia. So here's my family. And uh, they gave me this koala to hold. And they told me I had to be very calm because the koala has very long claws. And that eucalyptus leaf is in his mouth, not mine. All right. So it turns out that, so now I'm sure you can make polyane nanofibers. But if you try to make other kinds of nanofibers with other forms of poly polyaniline, substituted polyaniline, you tend to get a bronze. And so we went back and we looked at the original reaction. And so it's a radical polymerization. And so the, the rate limiting step is monomer going to dimer. And we realized that if we speed it up, we probably can do better. And so we simply took dimer and we stuck it back in the reaction. In doing that, we've now been able to make almost any form of substituted polyaniline into nanofibers. And the same trick works for things like polythiophene. So if you take terthiophene, you'll speed up that reaction. If you take biparole, you'll speed up this reaction. You can make nanofibers of any, anything you like. And the key is controlling the speed of the reaction. Now, we're also interested in understanding 
the, the molecule. And so tetraaniline is the basic building block. It's just four units long. And what we're interested in, you know, most people think with conjugated polymers that the longer the conjugation length, the higher the conductivity. Well, that would make some sense, except often it's hard to control that length, and often the, the chain length is not the conjugation length. So we wanted to ask the opposite question. You know, is it the chain length or is it hopping between chains that make a difference? And so the tetramer is only four units long. It's the smallest repeat unit. And by just simply doing the, a simple growth mechanism, we were able to do grow these different kinds of structures. So we could grow fettuccine structures. Uh, we could grow some, some bars. And we even made some flowers. And I should say this is with my colleague, John Feng Guan, because he helped us do some conductivity measurements. And what I'm showing you is conventional polyamide is a conductivity of about 1 to 10 siemens per centimeter. Well, here's one of these single crystals that we grew. And we put it between two gold electrodes. And we actually got a conductivity of about one, so up to that of conventional polyamide. So it's amazing if you get really good structures, you can get really high conductivity. And in fact, we looked at how this growth works. And what happens is we get nanofibers, and the nanofibers will go, and they'll start to make sheets. So you go from a 1D material to a 2D material, and then the sheets can stack up. And if they renucleate, so if they stack up, you get 3D plates. If they renucleate, you'll end up with flowers. And we can actually look at these, and these are TM images, and you can actually see that you're getting um, spots from our really single crystals. And we can work out what the structure is of these materials. And then using a form of, of tunneling microscopy, uh, we were able to look at the conductivity of these, and we've gotten above 10 siemens per centimeter. So what's interesting about this is you can get the conductivity of the bulk polymer simply using tetraaniline. And so it really is hopping between chains that controls the conductivity. Of course, if you can go longer, if you go to the optimum itself, the conductivity should shoot up. All right, now back to the more applied research. So I mentioned to you that one of the key things that we discovered is that because we know we want to limit secondary growth, if we take a stoichiometric amount of oxygen and aniline, throw them together, everything grows, and you end up with these nanofibers. And I want to prove to you that this reaction is scalable. So we started working with a company in Korea, one of the major conglomerates called Colon. And they actually produce nylon as well as many other polymers. And so they agreed to help us with this. And this is a 100 liter pilot plant reaction. And we're doing the exact same thing that I said, going to polyaline nanofibers. Now, what they were concerned is, is because the radical polymerization would this get hot? And the answer is no. We only we observed less than a, a three degree increase in temperature on this large 100 liter scale. So this is a completely um, <clears throat> scalable process. And in fact, we can then take it and we can run it through filters and we can get out the material. And I'll show you what it looks like. So if we dry it out, you get these large cakes of material. And when you look under a microscope, you end up with a nanofiber. So this is a completely scalable reaction. And of course, aniline is a very inexpensive commodity chemical. All right, so what did we do? Well, we started working um, with a company called Water Plant. And I should thank my colleague, Eric Hook, because he, in civil engineering, because he came up with this idea. And so what we did is we put this into these filters. And it turns out that they can filter oil from water. Now, Water Planet has two pieces of technology. The first piece is they have a high efficiency centrifuge that can polish off about 99% of the oil, because oil companies want their oil back. And then they can use our membranes to clean up the last 1%. And when you're done, the water that comes out of these membranes, of course, this is a small one, but it's clean enough you could drink the water. And this is a, a original pilot scale testing of, of these. And we call them polyserum membranes because we have a polymer that acts like a ceramic. The only other membrane that can do oil water separations are ceramics, and they're very expensive to use. And in fact, we ran a test. And the key to our membrane is this low contact angle. This is a captive bubble experiment. And before our membrane, the most hydrophilic membrane you can get is polyethylene fluoride. It has a contact angle of about 60 degrees when you bring up this bubble. 
Ours is down to 13.3 degrees, so it's extremely hydrophilic. I can't show you the opposite experiment because I put a drop of water and just soak right in across, across the membrane. But because of that, this membrane likes, likes water, it hates oil. And so in a real world test between a ceramic membrane and, and our membrane, they ran it for one week, and after one week, the ceramic membrane was down to 5% capacity because it still clogs. Ours was running at 95%. So what happens is you can also back flush them, but it takes a lot of energy. So ultimately this saves about 40% of the energy of separating oil from water. And so that makes it uh, the key to making this work. And so what I want to show you here is here's actually a plant using these membranes. So again, this is a small membrane. You can see how large these membranes really are. And they can put hundreds or thousands of these in series in parallel and solve any, any water problem. Because what we don't want is we don't want the oil companies dumping water um, back into lakes and streams and so on. And so hopefully you get the idea that, that a basic research problem can lead to something quite useful. Okay, with that I hope I've convinced you that it's fairly easy to scale up polyamine synthesis. We started with interfacial polymerization, but the rapid mixing is much easier to scale. We've looked at sensors. We can sense acids with polyaline. We can sense bases with dope polyaline. We can make metal nanocomposites, do memory catalysis, flash welding, and actuators. And of course, the thing I'm most excited about are the oil water separations. I need to thank the people who have actually done all this work. You've met some of them. Um, Julio is an assistant professor at Washington University. Uh, Yu Wang did the, she's an assistant professor at UC Merced, she did the stuff with the uh, tetraaniline, and uh, I've mentioned a lot of my collaborators in funding agencies. And I want to leave you with one more picture. So this is something that Yu Wang did. She took one of the micrographs of the polyaniline that had renucleated. We simply colored this violet, and we called this polyaniline in full bloom, and it won the science and art contest uh, first place at the Materials Research Society meeting. And with that, let me thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to answer questions. I think Professor Kenneth Kerr, uh, so where was the material? I'm not sure what I was saying, how to do. <laughs> uh, we have time for one question. Uh, thank you for what I think for talk talk. Actually, I have uh, two quick questions. The first is that uh, uh, how about the recycle will be of your membrane, but after how many cycles you still have high, uh, high productivity for the filtering. And the second is that like, uh, uh, the membrane is strong, but it's, uh, it's, it's uh, very carefully robust to stand for the chair. Okay, so the first question is how stable are the membranes? So as far as we know, they're quite stable. They're, they're rated to last for 20 years. So there's no degradation that, that we can see. Um, and of course, if they get clogged, you just simply back flush them. But, but the whole idea is that they cut down on that. Your second question, I'm not sure I... Which cycle are we in the... How many we cycle? Oh, for the membranes? You should be able to cycle these, you know, at least for many years. So I, I don't see any problem with that. Basically, because they're, they're hydrophilic, the only thing going through them is water. Everything else just gets rejected at the surface. And so you're not actually doing damage to the surface of these membranes like you are with, with uh, regular membranes. But, but even, you know, even membranes these days are meant to last for on the order of 20 years. So I don't see any reason why. We're actually blending our material, I should tell you, into a traditional polymer, which will last that long. So I, I believe that they're, they're stable, and so do the companies that have, have used them. I should tell you, one of the questions, you know, I said when, when they started installing it, I said one of the good things is that we probably won't have anybody trying to compete with us in the sense that there's no colored membranes out there. So if anybody starts using a colored membrane, they'll know that they're, you know, infringing on our patents. But the company that, that's installing these said, well, that's the good news. The bad news is that every time they go to install it, the people say, we don't want a colored membrane that's going to leach into our water. And so they have to convince them that it's a high polymer, and it's stable, and it won't come out. 
And in fact, they're now testing these for fruit juice plants, milk processors, things like that. And, and then, of course, you absolutely don't want anything coming out. But, but they're quite clean, quite steady. It's a good question. 